In this chapter 11 video, we're going to talk about aggression, and we're going to link it into our topic on conformity. Now, the definition of aggression is probably what you think it is. It's harming someone else, and in this context, it's a social behavior. But So you need two people, one to act as aggressor, one to be the target of that. Now, there's two types of aggression, but I'm primarily going to focus on one. There is instrumental aggression. It's a type of aggression where... You harm someone, but that's by proxy, by nature of your act, but it wasn't your intent. You know, think of a child stealing a toy away from another child. That child falls down and hurts themselves. In theory, that child was not trying to be aggressive towards the kid. It was just selfishly taking the toy. It's different than hostile aggression, whereas my action is to specifically hurt or harm you in some way. That's what we're going to mainly focus on in this part of the chapter. Now, before I get into reasons why we might be more aggressive than others, I will bring up that familiar dichotomy because people often ask, are men or women more aggressive? And I'm telling you now, it's a bit of a loaded question, a bit of a trick question. Uh, without a doubt, none of us can debate the fact that men are by far more likely to use overt aggression, such as physical aggression. We only have to look at criminal statistics and uh, violent crimes, rape, murder, men are much more likely to be the perpetrators of those crimes. So if we see that data, we might say, well, it's obvious men are more aggressive. But the question is here is, do we have the same potential, the same capacity for aggression? And the answer seems to be yes. It's the mechanism that changes. For example, women are more likely to use relational aggression. That's manipulating social relationships to hurt or harm someone else. There's an example I put up here of a small child um, uh, it's a case study, a uh, first grade girl was mad at another first grade girl. And so she formed the Pretty Girls Club and invited everyone to join except that one girl. And for the rest of the year, that girl was ostracized from the class. That's relational aggression, using relationships to hurt or harm someone. If we were to look at verbal aggression, using our words to hurt or harm someone in a certain way, uh, men and women are about equal in that. It depends more on your position or power base than your sex. So we do see differences, but it doesn't answer the question, is one more aggressive? It seems that we all have equal potential for being aggressive. It may be the different mechanisms that we utilize and broadcast our aggression. That's what might change. Now let's hit some of those reasons of why some of us are more aggressive than others. Um, well, for humans in general, we're probably an aggressive species because at one time being aggressive may have helped our survival. From an evolutionary point of view, when we were simply like other animals trying to struggle and survive in this wilderness, well, those of us who were more aggressive were more likely to be able to protect our resources, protect our mates, protect our family, so reproduce, pass on those genes. Now, once again, we're coming to that same dilemma we've seen multiple times in this course, that our old evolutionary impulses don't fit well in a modern society, where today most of us would agree those overt aggressive actions do not help our society or our causes actually tend to diminish or decrease them. But since we're kind of on this, what do we pass on to generations, that means aggression might be able to be talked about in a biological terms, and the answer seems to be yes. There is evidence to support that some individuals are more aggressive by nature of the genes they've inherited about the neurological equipment that they've inherited. For example, in men and women who are more violent than others, we find a different functioning frontal lobe. Remember, the frontal lobe is the area that is responsible for things like self-control, impulse control. Some of the problems occur in people who have addiction issues. I mentioned dog breeds because it's a pretty easy to understand example of how biology can lend to aggression. For decades, even centuries, we've been breeding dogs to where we would take the most docile characteristics of wolves, we would breed those, create a less angry, a less aggressive species, then we would take the most docile version of that letter, breed those, and throughout the generations have been creating a wholly different species that, in comparison to their evolutionary roots, are a lot more malleable, a lot more docile than others. However, there are some dog breeds that seem to be more naturally aggressive than other dogs, and that speaks also to the breeding that we've engaged in. But beyond biology, there are some behavioral implications about why some of us are more aggressive than others. For example, in the last chapter on motivation, we learned about what a need is. It's some sort of deficiency that our body must alter itself or become a drive and move towards that need. 
Well, the frustration aggression hypothesis says that frustration, which is defined as a blocked need, can be a principal link or even a principal catalyst for aggression. For example, some of the nicest, most well-behaved people I know have ever met frankly scare me when they're in a traffic jam. What happened? Why did suddenly this aggressive behavior come out? Well, there is a need they have, in this case, to get somewhere. That need was blocked and it activated an aggressive response to try to restore that need. Similarly, with the traffic jam example, we can make a wider net and ask questions about the environment as a whole. Are there environmental uh, situations, environmental factors that may prime us to respond in aggressive ways? For example, when we look at those crime statistics, it's quite clear that one of the great predictors of that is heat. The hotter the day is, the more violent crime we tend to experience, not just seasonally, but within its own season. Speaking of priming, we talked about that in our chapter on memory, the idea that I can bring up information that makes you think or feel a certain way, even if you weren't planning to experience that. Well, priming also seems to be a good indicator of where aggression comes from. I gave you this example here that individuals with a gun in a house are 2.7 times more likely to be murdered than those without. Again, this is not a pro or anti-gun statement, but I want you to think about the concept of primer. If there's an object nearby that represents aggression, would we be more likely to be aggressive? Well, I can tell you studies have been done that demonstrated this. For example, we took students and paired them up and had them to debate very hot issues, so things like abortion, politics, religious questions, so big hot issues that tend to make us mad at each other. And within these debates, half of the students, their groups, they debated each other while holding a rubber ball. The other group of random students, while they debated the same hot topics, they held a baseball bat. Can you guess which group got much more aggressive, much more violent with each other? It's the group with the bats. Similar versions of the study have been done using rubber balls and then a toy wooden gun. And even though it's clearly a toy, we found that the groups holding the gun object were much more likely to get violent and get aggressive with each other. So it was enough to prime an aggressive response just by having that cue nearby. And finally, we can talk about observational learning, something we mentioned in previously in our intelligence chapter. Uh, we mentioned Bobo the Clown and how Bandura showed that children watching adults play specific ways with this toy, they emulated that play style as well. And that has a lot of implications about why some of us might be more violent. Maybe we simply have been observing a world where we believe that's the correct response. Maybe that's how mom and dad acted with each other. Maybe that's how parents disciplined us. And so we believe that physical violence or verbal aggression or whatever the form is, that's the right way to do things. Now, looking at a broader cultural context, maybe we can explain why some people are more aggressive by simply looking at the societal issues that are happening around them. For example, when we look at countries and we compare the wealthiest of the wealthy, the richest of the rich, to the poorest of the poor, and we say, how big is the gap between the very rich and the very poor? It's called the Gini or Gini Index. That's, it's a mathematical uh, equation that shows how large or how small the gap between the wealthy and the poor is. What may not surprise you is in the countries, such as in this example here, the higher the Gini Index, the more violent crime we see in that country. The lower the Gini Index, the lower the violent crime. Again, it's a correlation, but it's at least something to consider. And finally, since we're talking about culture, we can just ask ourselves, what kind of culture do we consume? Do we live in a world where we not only enjoy fictional accounts of violence and murder, but also in our news cycles? Do we draw towards the darker, the scarier, the more bizarre types of news stories? If we live in a world that we are constantly saturated with aggression as a world lens, a world view, would it surprise us that some of us would then respond to the world in the same way? That's sometimes what we see. Now, I mentioned linking this to conformity, and conformity is a pretty fascinating topic, uh, in part because it can be uh, looked at from the lens of why we do terrible things to each other. But we'll start first with a baseline conformity and defining what it is and some examples of how we do it. I don't want you to confuse the word conformity with 
culture. Uh, for example, most of my students wear blue jeans in class. Well, in theory, they all kind of look like they're dressed the same, but do I believe they're conforming? No, I believe it's the cultural value. The way we dress kind of reflects the culture. I don't see many kilts and I don't see many kimonos in my classroom, but that's not because my students are conforming to fashion trends necessarily. It's simply a cultural institution. It's different from conforming because with conforming, you have a personal belief, an idea, a behavior you believe is correct, but you will intentionally violate that belief so that you can be part of the social norm. So if you wear blue jeans, are you conforming? I don't think so. But if you tell me you would prefer to wear $20 blue jeans, but you intentionally bought $200 blue jeans because you wanted the other friends or the other group to accept you, then yes, that's conforming. You did something that was in violation of what you wanted because it was more important to fit in. Now the question has to be asked, is that always a bad thing? I'm going to say no. After all, have you ever stopped at a red light even though you still wanted to go somewhere? Have you ever gone to a movie with your boyfriend or girlfriend but you didn't really want to go, you just wanted to make them happy? Well, that's conforming. You violated the expectation or, or belief that you had. But in this case, you did it for a pro-social reason. You did it to sort of keep things moving, keep things together. So conformity isn't necessarily bad. In fact, in our daily lives, it sort of helps the wheels of society turn. It's when conformity has darker purposes, when we engage in behavior that's perhaps dangerous or reckless, that we do things that we understand would be harmful to ourselves, but that need to be part of a group may overwhelm that. Let's look at conformity through the lens of one of the more famous studies done on it, and in part because it's such a simple idea, a simple study. And it was first done by Solomon Ash in 1951, and the study goes like this. Six to ten students would come into a room, sit in a row, and look at a picture like you see on the screen. They would look at the line on the left, and then they would look at the three lines on the right. And the experimenter would ask, which of those lines matches the one on the left? Is it A, B, or C? Do you know the answer? The answer is A. It's, it's as easy as it looks. That's because that's not the real experiment. That was a lie. You see, of those 8 to 10 students, only one of those students was actually a test subject. The rest were fake. And so let's say you're the real student. You walk in, you sit in the middle of the group, and they say, all right, which one matches? And they point to the first student, and the first student says B. And the second student says B. And the third student says B. And then it comes to you. Will you say A? The answer might surprise you. In the first test, the correct answer is two. Uh, one. 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 Two. One. Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 Over 35% of st uh, the actual test subjects conform continuously. And the vast majority admitted to getting at least one wrong on purpose, even though they knew it was wrong, simply because they were starting to stand out, started to feel uncomfortable. And Ash did this experiment several different ways, and he found there were three variables that greatly increased the chance subjects would conform. The larger the group, meaning the more people that were saying the wrong answer, the more likely you would conform unanimity or standing with someone or alone. If at least one other student said the right answer, you would not conform. Someone has your back. But if everyone said the wrong answer and you were always alone in your choice, you were much more likely to conform. And finally, the nature of the task, meaning if the rules weren't explained to you, if we just sat you down and started doing this test and people were saying A or B or C without knowing clearly what the instructions are, you would tend to go with what the group says. So why do we conform? Well, first of all, we do it because we want to be right. And this is a, inherently a bad thing. I mean, if you don't understand a certain topic, you don't understand a certain idea, 
you ask several people, and if most people say go left versus go right, we will go left. That's just a pretty good bet that we might get the situation correct. But we also conform because, frankly, we want to be liked. We are a social animal. We've said that before. We tend to do our best work when we have social support. I don't mean we want to have lots of friends and we want to be popular. That's not true for all of us. But as a human, assuming that we don't have some emotional or personality disorder, there's something about being human that means we want to have social connections, friendships or compatriots, uh, colleagues at work. We want people to rely on, depend on, to have fun with. And so sometimes our beliefs, our values can be pushed aside because we want someone to pull us into the group. We want to be included in that group. That brings me to a very special type of conformity and also will bring me to one of the most famous experiments in scientific history. Uh, obedience is a special form of conformity because a authority figure is telling you to conform. You know, if you bought those pants even though you really didn't want to, if you smoked under the bleachers because you thought it would make you fit in with that group, at the end of the day, you made that decision. But obedience is where an authority figure tells you to conform, and the question is, will you do so? That's the question that Stanley Milgram was interested in, especially since this is, you know, coming off the hills in the 50s of... Uh, World War II, you know, we saw an entire country, an entire nation of Germany uh, engage in behaviors such as the systematic killing of Jews by the millions. And so Milgram, like others, wanted to know how could people participate in these activities that they were quite clear afterwards they didn't support, but they did it anyway. You know, we it's, it's foolish to believe that overnight a country woke up and suddenly every man, woman, and child was evil. But instead, the question is, why did they do things even though they didn't necessarily believe in those things? That's the experiment he came up with. And it goes like this. Two volunteers, uh, which they put an uh, advertisement in the paper, so it wasn't just students. They had all sorts of people. Two volunteers would come in at a time. Randomly, they would be given a position. They would draw a name from a hat. Some of you would be the teacher, and some of you might be the learner or the student. If you're the learner, you're going to sit in a separate room. You're going to have a list of word pairs, and you're going to have to memorize them. For example, if the word pair says boy equals blue, then if you're asked boy, green, yellow, purple, blue, what's the right answer? So you have to memorize all these word pairs. If you're the teacher, you're sitting in the room with the experimenter, Stanley Milgram, the person who devised this. Now the teacher, as you might see, is sitting in front of the device because Milgram told his subjects that he believed punishment would increase memory. And so as a teacher, you will ask the first question, boy. Now as the student, if the student says blue, you tell them they got the right answer over a microphone. If the student picks the wrong answer, you flip that first switch on the box you see in front of you. That switch will give them a 15 volt shock. If they get the next answer wrong, or when they get a next answer wrong, you flip the second switch and now they get 30 volts of shock. If they get another one wrong, 45 volts. And if they get another one wrong, 60. This machine goes up into 15 volt increments and it goes from 15 all the way to 450 volts. And if you don't know much about electricity, at 100 volts, that definitely hurts. At 300 volts, you could do some permanent damage to the skin. And after 400 to 450 volts, which was marked from a device for the teacher, it could be fatal, depending on the heart condition or the physical condition of the subject being constantly shocked. So this was the experiment, all right? And what I'm gonna show you now is a video of someone, an actual test subject from this original test, given the shocks. The person you hear talking in the background is Milgram, giving him instructions. And then the learner, you can't see him, but you will hear his reactions. Watch closely and pay special attention to the teacher. Wrong, 90 volts. <coughs> Wrong. Volts. 
135 and a woman and white cloud horse rock house answer wrong hundred fifty volt answer horse <laughs> Experiment. That's all. Get me out of here. I told you I had my trouble. My hair's starting to bother me now. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. I refuse to go on. Let me out. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Next word is sad. I'm gonna keep going. Continue, please. Oh, sad. Sad. Face, music, clown, girl. Correct. Next one, short. Sentence, movie, skirt, time. Answer, please. Wrong. Under 65 volts. Time. Let me out. Continue, please. Go on. Conditioned in. You want me to go? Just continue, please. Sh sharp. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Answer, please. Wrong. I'm up to 180 volts. Please continue, teacher. Needle, you're going to get a shot. 180 volts. I said before, the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not dangerous. They're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue, teacher. Yeah, but uh, I'm not going to get that man sick of that. I mean, he's hollering in there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he's Whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until well, he's learned I mean, all the uh, words. I right. refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. I'm not going to. I mean, he's under hollering. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. There's too many left here, and I mean, geez, he, go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Answer, please. Wrong. 195 volts. Dance. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Continue, please. Let me out of here. You have no right to keep me here. Let me out. Let me out of here. Let me out. Let me out of here. My eyes bother me. Let me out. 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 Let me Twenty-five volts. The word is noise. No. House, pet, book, name. Answer, please. Correct. Next one. Quiet. Song, party, child, evening. Correct. Nice one. Tame. Wolf, bear, dog, cat. Wrong. <coughs> Answer is bear. 240 volts. <coughs> nice one. Sweet. Nice yeah. No, you go back up to the beginning of that page and go through it again until he's learned them all correctly. Oh, no. No, I'm not going to kill that man. Again. You mean i got to keep going up with the scale? No, sir, he's all over there. I'm not going to give him 450 volts. 
The experiment requires that you I know continue. it does, but that man is hollering in there, sir. As I said before, although the shocks may be painful, yeah, they're not dangerous. I mean, he's, he's yelling in there. Start with blue, please, at the top of the page. Continue, please, teacher. Well, I told him we're going over it again. No, just, just go ahead. Blue. Boy. Girl grass hat. Correct. Nice. Day sky job chair. Wrong. Answer is day. 285 volts. Continue, please. Fat. Man, lady, tub, neck. Answer, please. Wrong. Answer is neck. 300 volts. <coughs> Absolutely refuse to answer anymore. Get me out of here. You can't hold me here. Get me out. Get me out of here. Continue. The next word is green, please. Green. Grass, hat, ink, apple. If the learner doesn't answer in a reasonable time, about four or five seconds, consider the answer wrong and follow the same procedure as you have been doing for wrong answers. Say wrong, tell them the number of volts, give them the punishment, read them the correct answer. Oh, man. Continue, please. Uh, green. Grass, hat, ink, apple. Answer, please. Go on with the procedure, please, teacher. 315 volts, the answer is ink. Next one. Well, you gotta keep getting a shock if you don't answer. The next one is rich. 330 volts. Next one, fast. Bird, car, train, plane. Go on, please. With the please answer. The answer is bird. Three hundred and forty five volts. <coughs> Blunt, knife, stick, word, arrow. Answer, please. Continue, please. The answer is arrow. 360 volts. <coughs> Go on, please, with the experiment. Please continue. Soft, rug, pillow, hair, grass. Answer, please. Go on, teacher. Hair, 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering on less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Not once we've started. Please continue, teacher. Cool, day, shade, water, cave. Answer, please, are you all right in there? Are you all right? Please continue, teacher. Oh, you know, I keep giving them shocks. Continue. Please. I'm up to 390. Continue, please. Something's happened to that man in there. Nice one, gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Something's happened to that man in there. You better check in on him, sir. He won't answer me or nothing. Please continue. Go on, please. You accept all the responsibility? The responsibility is mine. Correct. Please go on. Gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. 
Answer, please. Are you all right? 405 volts. The answer is moon. I'm actually hard. Stone head bread work. Answer, please. The answer is head 420 volts. Next one, wet, night, grass, duck, cloth. The answer is duck. 435 volts. It says danger, severe shock here. Next six on the next one. Continue, please. 435 volts. Next one, brave, woman, soldier, dog, horse. Answer is woman, 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. Don't you think you should look in on them, please? Not once we've started the experiment. But what if something's happened to the man hadn't attacked or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, uh, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must... But he might be dead in there. I mean, some people can't take the shock, sir. Please I mean, continue. I don't have to be rude, but I mean, I think you should look in on them. Well, I mean, all you got to do is look at the door. I don't get no answer, no noise. Something I think has happened to the gentleman in there, sir. We must continue. Go on, please. You're going to keep giving them, what, 450 volts every shot now? That's correct. Continue. The next word is white. When Milgram first pitched this experiment, he asked, how many people do you believe will actually go all the way to the 450, the lethal shock? He asked his psychological and psychiatric friends this question to try to get a baseline. And here's what they said. They believed that most of us would go to about 150 volts. At that point, when the test subject starts yelling, starts screaming, we would stop. They believed 1 in, two, one in 25 excuse me, they believed that 1 in 25 people would go to 300 volts. That's the pretty extreme, the guy, uh, you heard him say, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm not answering anymore, I don't want to do this. They believed at that point, pretty much every single person would quit. And when asked about the 450, the psychiatrist said, maybe 1 in 1,000 would actually go all the way to 450 volts. That's like your, your sociopaths, your psychopaths, your killers, your mentally ill. Uh, most of us would stop. Only a 0.001% of us would go to 450 volts. So Milgram did the experiment just like you saw in the video. And he found that two out of three people, 66% went all the way, not 0.001%, not sociopaths and psychopaths. Two out of three of us went all the way to 450. The rest of us, almost every single person, it was like 98% went to 300 volts, not 0.04%, 98%. And in fact, here's some stats here. You can see for one of the trials that they did, Okay, pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable that this happened. You can see a picture of the test subject there. Now, if you're not familiar with the study or if you read it in your book um, and maybe missed this idea, it's important to say, let's be clear, the study was not real. The person was never truly being shocked. He was always fake. He was always acting. We're not going to intentionally torture someone possibly kill someone. But the real experiment obviously was not about memorization. It was about obedience. Would test subjects go all the way? Would they do something they didn't want to do just because someone in authority told them? And as you saw in the video, the man did not want to do this. In fact, he tried to stop. But with the right words and the right phrases, Milgram was able to diffuse that responsibility and get this man, as well as most of us, to go all the way to 450 volts. Now it's important to know something about this experiment. We will never do this experiment again, not in its full capacity. That's because unfortunately, the byproducts, the psychological byproducts were far more harmful than we anticipated. Years after the study was done, men and women still had psychological problems based on participating in the study. Because think about it, you walked in, you volunteered, 
And according to Milgram, he offered them $10, $20 for their uh, participation. But he told them up front, uh, even though you get paid for this experiment, you can leave at any time and get all the money. So the money's not the issue. But men and women had to face the fact that they walked into a room and because of the instructions, not the demands, the instructions of a man in a lab coat, they tortured and they thought they killed another person. That's a pretty terrible thing to confront about ourselves because often we say things like, I would never, dot, dot, dot. A true psychologist will tell you, never say never. We don't know what the circumstance will be like until we're in it, as these men and women unfortunately learned. So we'll stop there in our talk on conformity and aggression. When we come back, we'll look at how groups can influence your behavior for better or worse. See you then.